Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Last season, we delved into some perennial issues using the Bible and a little bit of analysis to learn the truth about them. And this season, we'll be returning to a topic from some time ago, the Psalms and their meaning. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The Psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy, and to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the psalm has in the Douay Rheims Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list psalm numbers as they're given in the Douay Rheims Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 26 in the Douay Rheims Bible, but Psalm 27 in the RSV. The Psalm of David, before he was anointed. A brief description of this psalm and how it was first used. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the protector of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David's question is meant to imply that there is no one who he should be afraid of, and in the process of saying this, he also expresses three things that God does for him. He's the light for David, guiding him in the right way to act. He's the protector of David's life, shielding him from the enemies and misfortunes that seek to drive him off the path or trick him into doing evil. Finally, he's the salvation of David, since no one can be saved without the help of God. David knows that one day God will save him, and we have every reason to expect the same, so long as we remain faithful to God. Whilst the wicked draw near against me to eat my flesh, my enemies that troubled me have themselves been weakened and have fallen. David's enemies are so evil and fearsome that he compares them to cannibals, but recognizes that all of their apparent strength can be removed in an instant if God chooses to do so. If armies in camp should stand together against me, my heart shall not fear. If a battle should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. No mortal man and no army of mortal men can claim any kind of victory over Almighty God. It would be like expecting a massive fleet of ships to claim victory over the ocean. This is a common theme in the early Psalms. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may see the delight of the Lord and may visit his temple. There was no temple of the Lord in the days of King David. There was, of course, the tabernacle, a holy place where worship and sacrifice were performed, and the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was held, but it wasn't precisely a temple. David longs for the chance to see the temple of God with his own eyes, though it would only be built by his son. In the meantime, he's committed to obeying the will of God to the best of his ability. For he hath hidden me in his tabernacle, in the day of evils, he hath protected me in the secret place of his tabernacle. The tabernacle had been a major part of life and worship among the Israelites for many generations at this point, so David seems to be saying that the worship of God is what really protects him. Ever since his fight with Goliath, and probably well before, that's been a true statement. He hath exalted me upon a rock, and now he hath lifted up my head above my enemies. I have gone round, and have offered up in his tabernacle a sacrifice of jubilation. I will sing and recite a psalm to the Lord. King David wrote many of the psalms that we still have. The practice of sacrifices offered at the tabernacle would also have been very familiar to him. His main point in offering this praise to God is out of gratitude for the victories he's experienced over his foes, which he knows are not entirely his own doing. God is the one who exalts one man over another. Hear, O Lord, my voice, with which I have cried to thee. Have mercy on me, and hear me. My heart hath said to thee, my face hath sought thee. Thy face, O Lord, will I still seek. Unlike Moses, David never saw God with his eyes, and he considers this a goal worth pursuing. According to the later writings of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 13.12, those in heaven experience this great gift. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Turn not away thy face from me, decline not in thy wrath from thy servant, be thou my helper, forsake me not, do not thou despise me, O God my Saviour. Seek to serve God, and to be worthy of the gift of seeing his face. We also ask for help from God, that God won't abandon us. For my father and my mother have left me, but the Lord hath taken me up. God takes care of us, even when our parents won't or can't. Set me, O Lord, a law in thy way, and guide me in the right path because of my enemies. 
Often the best way to protect a person from their enemies is to give them good advice about how to avoid them. God can give David this guidance, and even guidance to help him trap some of his enemies. We can also request the help of God in overcoming our foes. Deliver me not over to the will of them that trouble me, for unjust witnesses have risen up against me, and iniquity hath lied to itself. This verse rings with the later experiences of Jesus, who had false witnesses brought against him by the Pharisees to pass an unjust verdict against him. This kind of evil is like a fingerprint. Again and again, we find it being used against the righteous, and David experienced similar instances of people bearing false witness against him. He pleads that God will not allow such horrible deceivers to have their way against him. I believe to see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living. David has faith that the Lord will share his great gifts, though when he expects this to happen is unclear, and depends on what he means by land of the living. He may expect God to do this for him while he's still alive on this earth, an expectation that, as it turned out, was well justified. Or he may be anticipating some future land that God will give to his faithful after bringing them back to life. For us, the term land of the living adopts a heavenly significance, because as Jesus said, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. Expect the Lord, do manfully, and let thy heart take courage, and wait thou for the Lord. Whenever times seem hopeless, and we feel afraid of what the future holds, we should trust in the Lord, and remember that he will always be faithful. In the meantime, we need to do the best that we can in bravery and anticipation. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.